everybody, it's Tanya and welcome to today's reading vlog. This video is going to be a reading vlog of the Count of Monte Cristo. As you can tell by the book, I have already finished reading it. Um, it's just that I realized that I accidentally deleted the intro clip from my camera, so this is me redoing it. I am not going to tell you much how I felt about the book in this clip, but I will just tell you one thing, that in this video you're going to see my heart being slowly crushed by Alexandra Dumas. <laughs> this is very dramatic, but this is pretty much what happened. So, apart from that, hey, welcome to this reading vlog. I hope you're going to enjoy. And now let's start reading. I am on chapter 2 of the Count of Monte Cristo and Edmund has just arrived home from like 3 months of traveling and this scene of him meeting his father after 3 months is like the most heartwarming but also heart reaching scenes so I just wanted to read it to you holding the banister with one hand while the other repressed the beating of his heart he stopped before a half open door through which he could see the back of a small room in this room lived Dantes's father news of the arrival of the pharaoh hadn't yet reached the old man, who was standing on a chair, engaged with trembling hands and pinning up some flowers that climbed across the trails outside his window. Suddenly he felt himself grasped around the waist, and a well-known voice exclaimed behind him, Father, my dear father. The old man cried out and turned around, then, seeing his son, fell into his arms, pale and trembling. What is it, father? The young man exclaimed with concern. Are you unwell? No, no, dear Edmund, my son, my child. No, but I was not expecting you, and the joy, the shock of seeing you like this unexpectedly, oh heavens, it's too much for me. Tell me this is not the most beautiful father and son moment you have ever read. <laughs> At least like in my experience, I think this is the most beautiful moment. I just really enjoyed it. So yeah, I'm really enjoying this book currently. Having, I'm having, well, it was just the second uh, chapter. I think it's going to be an emotional read because, like, if, if if the second chapter if so is so emotional, so then the rest of the book must be even more probably. I cannot imagine what's going to be in the end. <laughs> so yeah, this was. I think it was a beautiful father and son moment in the book. I just want to point something out. If you were thinking that the book is dense. Look at it. Look at it. It is all dialogues. It's pretty much all dialogue. Look at it. Dialogue, dialogue, dialogue. It's all dialogues. It is so easy to read. It is so easy to read, honestly. Dialogue. It's all dialogues. Hi. So, as I have just mentioned, I because normally I think it's what you expect of a classic. You expect a classic to be super, super dense and have like a lot of long passages describing sunset or sea or, I don't know, furniture, clothes, whatever. With this book, he gets straight to the point and majority of the text are dialogues. At least like what I have read so far, it has all been dialogues. And it's like, it's super easy to get through, like you don't have to work at all. Like, I think it would be a good like comfort read or maybe a good read if you are in a reading slump. Like, obviously I'm in the very beginning, but so far it has been enjoyable and easy. So if you're in a reading slump, consider The Count of Monte Cristo, I guess. <laughs> or, okay, maybe Alexander Dumas in general, he has shorter books as well. Also, one more thing I wanted to mention is that I have just read chapter 8, so it's 
at the if I don't know if I pronounced the name of the prison correctly I have never learned French so I don't know how to read it but yeah basically shut the if and I thought this chapter was written so well because it starts off with Edmund still having hope that the deputy crown prosecutor is on his side that he's going to protect him that everything is still going to be okay that he is soon to be reunited with mercedes and then by the end of the chapter we see him completely crushed like this whole chapter was like a journey from still having hope to becoming a madman. He, he is practically a madman at the end of this chapter. And seeing this transformation, seeing how it happened is of course terrifying, but just the whole chapter was so atmospheric and yeah, I thought it was so well done. Just in one chapter, turning from this pure child, like an angel, hoping and waiting to be saved into at first a man realizing what is going on and then slowly acknowledging how helpless he is and ultimately losing all hopes and becoming mad I thought it was so good so good I thought it was so good So it has been a while since I last picked up The Count of Monte Cristo as I was reading <laughs> The Old Drift by Novalis Rafael. I'm going to get back on track with The Count of Monte Cristo. Well, not back on track, but just continue reading it a little bit. So I've read chapters 15, 16 uh, with um, this Abby, whom Edmund met in the Shad Dave. And I thought, I think he's going to be my new favorite character along with Edmund's father. I have very tender feelings towards Edmund's father. I feel like he is a very lovely old man, but we have only seen very little of him. But I really, really, I, I think I just love their tender relationship, like relationship between Edmund and his dad. And now this Abby, he is just an incredible person. He obviously he's in prison. He is a scholar, so he's very educated, but he is also like not despaired. Like the things that he does, like he makes his own pens, he makes his own paper, he still writes books, he still learns languages. Like for example, he mentioned here in the book like how he learns language. Obviously he doesn't have any books, so how he does it. I have compiled a vocabulary of the words that I know and have arranged them, combined them and turned them one way, then the other, so as to make them sufficient to express my thoughts. I know about 1000 words, which is all I absolutely need, though I believe there are hundred thousands in dictionaries. Of course I shall not be a polished speaker, but I shall make myself understood perfectly, which is good enough. I, when I read this book, it's exactly what my language teachers has always told me. Like, there are thousands of words in a language, but you only need a thousand or two to, like, speak and to communicate to people. I, like, these words, when he was talking about language learning, I was like, so approach to language learning apparently was similar back then and still now. So that's I don't know, I just found it very interesting how similar the approach was. And yeah, so basically he makes his own pens out of bones. He makes his own ink out of um, kind of dust that he finds on the wall. And it was just, it was so impressive. And then the in the next chapter, in chapter 17, um, his cell is described and he has so many things. He has made his clock, how he can check check the time. He has like a small kind of hole in the wall where he keeps his um, 
instruments that he used to make the hole in the like the passage in the wall kind of to plan his escape so he the man has a lot of like incredible things and just imagining his situation and how he is you know not despairing and uh, and say so everybody thinks him insane because he always talks about like this pile of gold and he offers um, all the officers like millions if they set him free uh, which of course they cannot do and they don't even believe him even even Edmund doesn't believe him uh, but the man is just he's really impressive he's very imp I'm like I'm just mind blown by this character oh, everybody please forgive me hair but I've just been reading the chapter where Edmund I mean it's not going to be a spoiler if I tell you that Edmund escapes from prison. I feel like you already know it. Like, it is just four pages. Four pages. And I am exhausted. I am exhausted after this chapter. When, like, how? How he escapes? I'm, I, f I would never. I'm like, Edmund, you are a genius. It's hands down, Edmund, genius you are. I, it's just insane. Like, this whole chapter is so good. Four pages, but I am, it was, I've been through so much. <laughs> I've just been through so much with this chapter. Insane, insane. Oh, but so good. But so good. <sighs> I will continue reading because I have to know what's going to happen. Edmund is alone in the sea. So what's going to happen? I mean, I know he's going to survive, but because hello, 1200 pages. <laughs> but still, this chapter was so insane. Like when he gets the idea, it's just such an interesting like episode when he gets the idea of the escape, like how to do it. He was like, oh my God, this idea. Where did it come from? It's just, you know, like, like it came to him out of nowhere, but at the same time, like, somebody sent it to him, and we all know who sent it to him. We all know who sent this idea to him. Oh. This chapter was so good. I'll continue reading. Hello, everyone. Please excuse the hair, but I'm reading Count of Monte Cristo. I am on... I am at chapter 41, I think it's... Yes, 41. I don't think it's a spoiler because, like, you probably would guess it anyway. But basically, this is the moment when Mercedes appears again. This is... This is so emotional. I will not tell you, like, what happens and, like, but it's just... I'm like, Mercedes is here and he's seeing her again. And I'm just... <laughs> this is so emotional. <sighs> oh. Hi everybody, let me update you on my reading. Yesterday I have done such a good progress with the Count of Monte Cristo. I was so happy with myself and so proud. But also it's just that the part that I read yesterday was so so good <laughs> i just could not put it down yesterday i spent pretty much all day out of the house i wasn't at home i had to go to work and then i had to come home then i had to go to my japanese lesson class so i was all day not at home i was reading on the train majority of the time um and a little bit in the evening and a little bit in the morning in a coffee shop before work and so I think I read like 100, maybe around 30 or like 40 pages, which is like for me is a lot. For me in English in one day is a lot. It's just that it was so gripping and I just wanted to know what is going to happen. I just couldn't, couldn't put it down. I think Jumai is very good at writing these like suspenseful scenes. He just kind of grabs you and he doesn't let you go <laughs> until you know what happens. It was so cool. It was so cool. It was such a wonderful experience. Obviously, I will not be talking about like happened, uh, but basically, for those of you who have read it, what I did read, like I will just give you a hint of what I was reading. Um, I was reading the chapter 
where Valentine was supposed to sign her contract. If you read it, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> it was so good. So yeah, basically I just wanted to rave a little bit about Juma and his suspenseful scene writing. It was very gripping. And I just love Valentine and Maximilian. Like together they're just... But also I feel like Maximilian is... Um, he's kind of Dantes in a way. I feel like the Count of Monte Cristo, the the Dantes, <laughs> he kind of sees maybe himself in Maximilian. Oh. It just, it's just, he has the same ardor, he has the same passion, he has, he is also, his press, he is also very intelligent, he is, like Dantes was a sailor and this guy is an officer. They have like quite similar, you know, ways of life, not life, but like, you know, walks of life, they work similar situations not exactly but still yeah both of them are like handsome both of them are like you know intelligent and smart and brave and i feel like just it's not that edmund only feels gratitude towards maximilian's father i think he also sees himself like kind of he his youth in this boy and he just wants the best for him because he didn't have that best and so he wants to kind of i don't know i feel like he feels he just feels for maximilian and i just love it because uh, like i feel like maximilian probably is the only character for whom uh, he has such warm and kind feelings at this point of the book and i just love seeing it like it's something i i, will, I would want to see more maybe but again with the situation in this book obviously like you cannot really see more uh, but yeah i'm glad that there is this relationship and this uh, kind of warmth between maximilian and the count of monte cristo so yeah that's what i read yesterday and i will continue reading <laughs> i have just read the chapter where i will not tell you much but for those who read this is the chapter with the poison in the crown prosecutor's house they're going to accuse a wrong person they're going to accuse a wrong person no <laughs> i i cannot i was like oh no 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 no, doctor you're a good doctor but but no and i'm just like oh this chapter was so good i was just i was just the like, region i couldn't i couldn't stop and i was just like almost crying i was like no doctor no no you are a wonderful person but no and i was just oh this was so good this chapter was so good oh okay i will continue reading but yeah in the second part of the book there are so many good chapters there are like long they're longer than regular chapters but they're so good i just i cannot put them down so and i'm just no just please don't please don't <sighs> emotions <laughs> emotions i am overwhelmed a little bit but oh I hope it's going to be okay. <laughs> I hope it's going to be okay because no, no. Old witch, that witch. I hate this woman. I hate this woman. I hate this woman. Basically, people who have read, it's the part where Valentine is in the same room with her grandfather, her best man herself and she says that she started drinking her grandfather's medicine so it's that part that witch <laughs> this book this part is yeah i'm in the very end i'm almost at the very end <sighs> that witch that witch i know what's happening i know what's happening that woman that woman she deserves the worst treatment. The worst. She needs to be stopped. Oh. Okay, I will continue reading. But this part. This part. So much. I have just been through so much with Fernand. 
those of you who have read, you understand. I have just been through so much with Fernand. And now this. And I just cannot. I cannot. <laughs> this book is making me very emotional. <sighs> I will continue. Break from the reading. Because I am at the part where Valentin is about to figure out. She's about to see who wants to poison her. And I just can't. I, I'm so emotional at this point. I'm just like, I need a break. I need a break. I need a break from this. So yeah, I need to a little bit compose myself <laughs> before I continue. Because she's about to know. But, but... It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. I will not tell you why it's going to be okay, but it's going to be okay. I cannot. I cannot. This book makes me very emotional, especially like the second part. I never was as... Okay, there was one moment when I was like as emotional in the first part. And then after page 700, it just hit me. It just hit me. And now like there are so many wonderful parts and so okay i'm going to a little bit calm down relax no not re i cannot relax drink some tea and then and then i'm going to figure out i mean i already know but still valentine is going to figure out who wants to poison her oh, this book is so good it's so good So I am nearing the end of the book and I just by accident reread um, like the first part, like the very first chapters where like everything is only starting, where Edmund is just arriving home, where he is meeting Mercedes, uh, because I, like I'm thinking, trying to think of like for my review. So I reread the beginning a little bit and something hit me. Like, uh, it's just, I don't know, maybe it's just my imagination, maybe it's just like my understanding. But I thought it was interesting how in the beginning of the book, when they're so poor, when they have nothing except for their love and affection for, uh, in case of Edmund, for his father and for Mercedes, in case of Mercedes for Edmund, Edmund's father, even Fernand as her friend, as her cousin and as her, as her brother, how happy they were uh, even though they had nothing they had practically no money how incredibly happy they were and then in the end when all of them are so mind-blowingly rich uh, Mercedes is rich Fernand is rich Dantes is insanely rich how all of them are so empty on the inside, how all of them are so incredibly poor in their uh, kind of spiritual life, I guess, um, how unhappy they are, how ruined they are, all of them, not just Edmund, but Mercedes and all of them. Danglars, Danglars was also has, he has always been, I guess, poor on the inside. But just like these two characters, especially Edmund and Mercedes. I'm not sure if it like was planned on purpose to kind of compare uh, and show that even in poorhood you can be very rich in some other aspects, but yet when you are rich you can be incredibly poor in some different aspects right like in spiritual sense or in sense of love and happiness not meaning like not having them um, i don't know if it was intentional but it just hit me like this contrast this contrast of the beginning of their incredible happiness and then their incredible unhappiness um, even in the middle of the book when nothing terrible is happening um, Still, they are unhappy people. 
even though they are so rich. Because Mercedes, she herself even mentioned once that she has never had a happy day in her life after Edmund's disappearance. So yeah, I don't know if it's intentional, but it feels like, you know, without love, all your riches. Like love is the main treasure that a person can have. Without love, everything else just fades and plays no, no part. Like it doesn't make a person happy, which is a trivial truth and like everybody knows it. Uh, but I think it's powerful nonetheless. <laughs> uh, so yeah, it just suddenly hit me. Everybody, so I'm preparing. I'm preparing to feel the last clip of the Count of Monte Cristo, but I just want... I think the last lines of the Count of Monte Cristo are so incredibly touching and they're so incredibly true that I just want to kind of share them with you. It's not a spoiler, it's not going to be a spoiler, but basically what he says. Uh, and Edmund. Edmund says to his friends, so he says, do live and be happy, children, dear to my heart, and never forget that until the day when God deigns to unveil the future to mankind, all human wisdom is contained in these two words, wait and hope. I don't know why, but this makes me emotional. <laughs> Maybe because it's the end of the book. Maybe I feel so emotional because like I'm finishing this book after like two weeks, two weeks, <laughs> two months of reading it. Um, and maybe I'm so emotional because like I'm saying goodbye to this, but also just this, I don't know, this like, it just really rings a bell for me. Like, I really like this last kind of line that uh, all human wisdom is contained in these two words, wait and hope. Oh, you see, makes me emotional. So yeah. This last, like, it made me emotional yesterday and it makes me emotional again when I, I'm reading it to you now. I don't know. Did you cry when you finished The Count of Monte Cristo? I could not, I didn't cry, but yeah, it just made me, you know, a little bit cheer up. <laughs> I'm not crying, uh, just a little bit cheering up. Is it going to be my, I don't know, like, when I think about this book, like, as a whole, I cannot say that it's like, it's my favorite book of all time, but then when I think It does make me feel things, you know, especially now in the end. Yeah, I don't know. I don't think that it's going to be like a super, like it's going to be my favorite book of all time, but it is definitely a book that I really, really loved. <laughs> um, I don't, I don't know, do you have like a list of all the books that you consider your best books of all time? I personally don't have such a list. Like if you ask me what are your favorite books of all times, well, I might have put some Russian classics on it, but like I would have to think really hard. <laughs> I don't think I have such a list, so that's why maybe I cannot say that. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe some books are uh, important in different parts of your life. This yeah, it made me cheer up. So yeah, but I I finished I finished the Count of Monte Cristo yesterday. Um, okay, I will film the last clip of this vlog like in a good location. <laughs> um, but yeah. I love this book. I really did. I really did. <laughs> Hi everybody. So this is going to be the last clip of this reading vlog. Yesterday evening, so during our reading sprints uh, on Discord, I finished. <laughs> I finally finished The Count of Monte Cristo after almost two months. Uh, I mean, maybe even a little bit more than two months. I remember there was a point in the middle, like when I was reading, I was like, this book is never ending. <laughs> and now it finished and I th I think I'm going to miss it. I already, I think I am already am missing uh, it. 
luckily I have a plan <laughs> to fill the void and you will see the plan um, in the future it's going to be one of my videos I will not talk about it like currently now too much because uh, I'm still processing it and the next video my next video will be a review for the Count of Monte Cristo so I will talk about like my feelings and thoughts about the book in the review and actually I've decided to make a series of videos dedicated to the Count of Monte Cristo there will be seven seven videos in the series so the first video being this my reading vlog second video being I will a little bit move so here you will see the uh, announcement of all the future videos dedicated to the Count of Monte Cristo because I really enjoyed this novel and I want to talk more about it I want to encourage people, those who still haven't read it, I want to encourage people to read it. Uh, I really enjoyed it. That being said, I have to say, this is primarily a book for your entertainment. This is an entertaining read. I don't, I personally do not think that it's like something super highbrow. It is um, quite a literary book. I think it... Um, Maybe not that much literary, but it do, you can see that it does draws a lot on, for example, One Thousand and One Night. It draws on history, on France and Europe in general. It draws on traditions and cultures of different places around Europe that people were interested in. So there are definitely quite a bit of information you can learn from this book. But I do not see it that much as like, uh, for example, analysis of human nature, examination of human soul or some, you know, some super deep psychological analysis. I don't think that it's that. But even with that, it does have some wonderful moral lessons. It does have some great just life lessons to teach you. And I do think that after reading this book, you become and a little bit better person than a person you were before. At least I feel it uh, for myself. Uh, because in the beginning, when I was reading this book, I was so much angry. I think I was angry as like, I, mean, I think it's it's meant to be that way. As a reader, you are very angry with the wrongdoers. Of the novel right people who did Edmund wrong and you really want revenge for them along with Edmund you want them to suffer in my case I didn't want them to die I wanted them to suffer so much just as much as Edmund and in the end of the novel by the end of the novel I think he shows you that he teaches you to feel compassion towards people. He teaches you to forgive. He shows you that you yourself are not without a fault. And it is unfair for you to require, to require revenge or suffering for, for other people. It's just, it makes you as a terrible, as much a terrible person as they are. So I feel like I have learned quite you know i have learned an important lesson throughout this book and yes it was first of all an entertainment read but i do think that it made me a better person so that's why i want people i want to encourage people to read this book and i want them to also enjoy it and to also love it that's why i decided to make this uh, series of videos dedicated to the Count of Monte Cristo. So the first video, like I said, is going to be this reading vlog. The second video after this reading vlog will be my review of the Count of Monte Cristo. So it will be the second video. Then I'm not sure if it's going to be in this exact uh, sequence, so I might change the sequence, but uh, other titles of the videos that you will see are going to be 10 reasons for you to read the Count of Monte Cristo. 10 fun facts about the Count of Monte Cristo. My favorite characters in this novel, talking about my favorite characters in this novel. Then there will be another reading vlog. Like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm going to attempt to fill the void <laughs> in my heart that the Count of Monte Cristo has left. So there will be another reading vlog with me reading books 
that I expect to be similar to the Count of Monte Cristo, or at least give me maybe a similar experience as this book did. So there will be that reading vlog. And then the last video is going to be 10 other books to read after the Count of Monte Cristo. So those will not be books that I have read, those will be books that I kind of found other people to rec recommend it to read after the Count of Monte Cristo and that I kind of marked to myself to read later. So I haven't read those books, but yeah, just I found books that might be a good choice if you want also to fill the void after the Count of Monte Cristo. I also hope you enjoyed this reading vlog. Thank you very much for watching and I will, yeah, I hope if you have read this book, let me know your experience with this. Let me know if you loved it, what is your final thoughts on the book. And yeah, for now, thank you very much for watching. I hope you are having a very good day. I hope you are reading good books and enjoying them. And I will see you soon in my next video, which is going to be a review of The Count of Monte Cristo. So thank you very much for watching. Have a good day and I will see you soon.